On June 18, 2011, my older sister Jana lost her battle to depression and died by suicide at the age of 30. She was always one to go more on the scenic route, but this time it had led her down a deep, dark path, a path that led to a hole that she felt she couldn't escape no matter how hard she tried. She was desperate, hopeless, and in immense emotional pain. Now let me tell you a story about a girl. A girl who was born to two loving parents and had a younger sister who admired her and wanted to be just like her. This girl would surround herself with comforting pets of all kinds. And she would have this vibrant personality and a bright smile that would light up any room that she walked into. This young girl was artistic and creative. She loved to draw and sketch and would win a, an award for her writing abilities. She would make pottery soup bowls for those who were less fortunate. And she would make jewelry whenever she had a free moment. It was through art and music and creative expression that she could let her emotions out. This young girl was book smart. She loved to learn and she would often travel the world in seek of that knowledge. And she graduated in record time with her GED and went on to Penn State University where she graduated with honors. She would just help inspire the individuals around her. From the outside looking in, it truly seemed like this girl had it all. But what if I told you she didn't? You see, deep inside, my sister struggled. And growing up, we didn't talk about mental health a lot. And it led to Jana wearing many masks and trying to hide her true identity from so many, which then led to this fear of being different and feelings of isolation from a young age. During her darkest moments, Jana would sabotage relationships and push away those who were closest to her because she didn't want them to see that darkness that loomed within her. She would sometimes admit she didn't want to be alive and would even attempt suicide a few times. And she would use substances to try to cope with what was happening in her world. However, Jana also had moments where she thrived, and that was when she was surrounded by caring adults and people who just allowed her to be her true self. It was in those moments that she was able to find and light that way of, of hope for so many by using her story of recovery. And it was during that time where she found her passion for helping with at-risk youth. But on June 18, 2011, none of that mattered. In that deep, dark hole that Jana was in, she couldn't see her own light anymore. She couldn't hold on to that hope. On that day, my world came crashing down. I couldn't understand what had happened. All I knew was my life was forever changed. My head began to be filled with so many questions. What could I have done differently to help Jana understand how much she was loved? How can I support my parents who were grieving the loss of one of their daughters? How was I supposed to find my next step forward? I had no answers and I quickly found myself in that same dark hole that my sister was in not that long ago. The grief journey is ongoing and it's full of ups and downs and twists and turns. I was lucky that I had so many friends and family members that I could lean on and who would walk beside me in my journey of grief. I was able to learn new coping skills that would help lessen the tidal waves of grief. And slowly, those millions of questions in my head turned into comforting and loving thoughts of my sister. And the pain in my heart began to lessen and be filled with love and hope, hope for a world that could be free of suicide. At the start of my journey of grief, I came across the work of Dr. David Rico, a psychotherapist who talks about the five inevitable facts of life and the happiness that we can find when we embrace them. These are the things that we wouldn't wish on our own worst enemy and that we try our hardest to protect our kids from. Everything changes and ends. Things do not always go according to plan. Life is not always fair. Pain is part of life and people are not always loving and loyal all of the time. 
My sister and I were supposed to grow old together. We were supposed to sit on rocking chairs and drink our tea and, and talk about whatever was happening in our lives. She was supposed to be there for the birth of my child and watch him grow up. And just like that, in the blink of an eye, everything was taken away. Everything changes and ends. Things don't go according to plans. Pain is part of life. And as a society, we don't talk about grief very often, especially ones that are stigmatized. And with that, sometimes it's just easier to not say anything rather than worry about reaching out and saying the wrong thing, which you can't do. But still, it's just sometimes easier to stay silent. People are not always loving and loyal all of the time. I was first angered by the words of Dr. Rico of this ability to find happiness when we're at our darkest moments in life. And I didn't understand it. And then I went home to my parents' house one weekend. And in the basement, I was going through an old box of papers, and I came across a letter that my sister had written to me uh, when I was in seventh grade. And it said that I was the wind beneath her wings, and that I could always find a way to keep going. And just like that, that tidal wave of grief hit me. And for the first time since her death, I wept. And his words, the words of Dr. David Rico, began to make sense. I could continue to allow life to control me, making destructive decisions and, and, and just living in this pain. Or I could take a deep breath and I could try to figure out what I could control in that moment. I couldn't bring my sister back no matter how hard I wished. And I couldn't make people change their reactions. But I could think about mine. I could look at what I had control over, what my reactions would be if I heard about the loss of somebody, how I could take care of myself and make sure that I was healing, that I could use my story to help inspire others and end the silence that surrounds mental health and suicide. And it is in that time where I decided that I could start the Jana Marie Foundation a nonprofit that harnesses the power of art and music and creative expression, where we can spark conversations and build connections and promote mental health and well being. Each and every day, I get to work with young people to just grow their confidence and teach practical tools to overcome adversity, as well as educate about mental health. We get to work with those in their community their parents, their teachers, their caring adults, and educate about the warning signs for our young people and the available resources in our community. And with that, we get to break down the barriers that often prevent that help-seeking behavior. Those warning signs can help save a life if we can recognize them and if we have comfort around having these conversations. Things like if we're noticing somebody experiencing hopelessness or behavior and mood changes. Maybe we're noticing that they're eating different or sleeping too much or too little. Maybe we see that they're writing or talking or posting about death or dying. Or maybe we know they've experienced a loss. Maybe it's the physical loss of a loved one, or maybe it's the loss of financial security, or the loss through a move, or maybe they're worried about losing their freedom. If we see these things in someone, we can all play a part in preventing suicide. We can engage with the individual. We can ask, are you okay? And then we can listen. Not listen to respond, but listen to truly be in that moment with the individual. We can make sure that their feelings are being validated and we can demonstrate empathy. And then we can continue to listen and if that spidey sense is going off in us, then we need to take that deep breath and dig deep to find the courage and bravery to ask a more direct suicide question. Are you thinking about ending your life? Or are you thinking about suicide? And if they say yes, or maybe, or sometimes, it's okay. We can take a deep breath again and we can thank them for their vulnerability and their trust in sharing that information with us. And then we can get them connected into that appropriate professional care. 
We can call the county crisis lines or we can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-TALK. I may never find the happiness in this situation that Dr. David Rico says that we can find by embracing them, but I have found peace. I have realized that I can take control and make sure that I do my part in creating spaces where we can come together as a community, where we have opportunities to express ourselves and where we can engage in difficult conversations. I can also make sure that I can be a caring adult for the life of a young person. We know that our young people need that support of, of adults and that when adults know how to have these conversations, when they know the warning signs, when they know what the resources are, we can have better outcomes for our children. And I can do my part in making sure I'm spreading that education. And I can make sure that I do kindness, small acts of kindness every single day. It is with that that we can spread hope. Together, I know we can open minds and save lives. We can encourage people to reach out for help, and we can re and encourage people to reach out to help. I hope you will join me in that mission. Thank you.